Okay, so it is... It is 8.42. And I believe... Klaus J said that she'd welcome visitors until 11 p.m. I believe she said. So we've we've got a bit of a bit of time. So let, first, let's have a look at the body. See if we can find the gunshot wound. And speaking of gunshot wound, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> speaking of gunshot wound, open drink. We'll see if we can find it. And okay. The bear's eyes are still glowing red. It's guarding over the freezing corpse hidden inside its belly. Oh, okay. Perception legendary, but it's very high. It's a fourteen. Why can't I just see it, please? I want to see all my pluses. Okay, minus one. Stop wasting time. You're smart. Minus one. Establish probable cause. But, we looked in the mouth, we refrigerated the body, Titus mentioned a wound, and we know there's a bullet in there. 97%, I, this better not fail, I will be annoyed. Your arm reaches there out, and your eyes close, as if by their own volition. Whoa. It's dark all around. You feel cold, dead flesh through the latex glove. It's right under the palm of your hand. Yeah, plus 16 modifiers, that's ridiculous. 14 <laughs> needed, we got a 25. But anyway, here we go. His face, his cheeks, his nose, his fat, swollen lips. Like a rubber spider, your gloved hand crawls on his features. Ew. Everything is silent. All around. Why do we need to put my fingers? Why do I need to put my fingers in his mouth? Okay, that's disgusting. But fine. Okay. The oral cavity is cold and moist. A ball-like tongue attaches itself to the base of the mouth, mm. curling around like a scallop. Why do you have to say it like that? You're on the right track. Okay. No, I need to look. I can't just play with it. A vision of black and dark red death, pried open by your hands and studded with teeth. Looks like he's laughing. Death fumes rising from his throat. And there, in the back of his mouth, above the bell of the uvula, right in the soft palate, you see a hole. Barely visible to the human eye, it is swollen shut, almost vanished. No larger than 0.4 centimeters in radius, the edges appear darker. So this must be like professional pit then. That's what I'm thinking. An abrasion collar. This is what we're after. Okay, abrasion collar. Abrasion collar. The lieutenant looks in. There's a pen in his hand. His notebook is open at the copy pile pa pa paper. Oh, touch it with my fingers gently. I have my gloves on, right? Oh shit! Have I got my fingerless gloves on? Oh a black god damn it! Of liquid runs into his throat from the wound. Put my. F Why am I putting my finger in? Your index fits right in there. A tight tunnel of flesh opens up, tissue damage, wide enough for two fingers. As you push both in, you reach through his mouth, oh. right into his brain stem. Brain stem? Yes, that's what this part is called. Oh, fine, fucking feel around. The basal ganglia feels clumpy. The bullet has torn apart his reptilian complex. Not the reptilian complex. Push deeper. Your yellow fingers slide into the remains of the limbic system. There is no resistance. It's gelatinous. The slug-like structures are damaged too. The tearing extends deep into both hemispheres. Oh, I don't like any of the words you're using. Stop using these words, please. The cavity is here, cut right between the hemispheres. 
The lieutenant answers with the sound of his pen on paper. Push deeper. Your fingers are all the way in now, reaching toward the inside of his skull. The cavity goes further, but the entry wound isn't wide enough for the rest of your hand to follow. Dang fuck, let's stop doing this then. No, don't wiggle in! Your fingers reach toward his skull. His cerebral cortex feels like jelly. Cold jelly. Strange fluid streams down your wrist as you push deeper. God damn it. it on the tip what do I finger. feel? What do I... F oh, bullet. Okay. I can deal with a bullet. So it better not be anything else. Sharp serrated <sighs> material. The edges cut right into your skin. This must be the bullet. Okay, 83% chance I can do this. Fish it out. Oh. I wonder what would have happened if I failed that. Like, would it, would I have just, like, destroyed his corpse? You pick the sharp metal bullet between your index and middle finger. With your face twisting from pain and concentration, all you need to do is just... I got it. Good, good. The fidge in the background buzzes with excitement, so all I need to do is slowly pull my fingers out. The inside of the head feels cold and smooth, like a glove, sweat dripping down your brow. Careful not to lose the prize between your fingers. I'm trying. I'm a trying. With a plop, your hand emerges from the mouth, covered in blood up to the wrist. Between your fingers, a small flower, a blossom made of lead. That sounds almost sweet after the shit I've had to do. A bullet. The lieutenant pulls out a small bag marked evidence under it. Drop it in. Hell yeah. The bullet falls in the bag, leaving a smattering of blood on the plastic. Yeah. He raises the bag under his eyes and says... Bum, bum, bum. A non calibre rifle, some kind of brittle alloy, fractured on impact. Okay. Yeah, you can. No, I'll have it. Can I have it? Of course. You deserve it. Excellent. No offense. It's not that I don't trust you, it's that I want everything in my bag so I can use it later. We need to add an item to the injury list. Injury number four. Oval entry wound with an abrasion collar, soft palate, back of mouth. High velocity, temporary cavity in brain tissue, small exit wound on the occiput. How does that sound? Yeah, sounds sounds right, sounds correct. I'm not going to say sounds like heaven, that's a very weird thing to say. Although it is nine o'clock at night and maybe I'm a little tired, you know? Opinion, fatal injury. This also concurs with the Hardy boys. And one last thing. We should demand injury number three, ligament mark. Treatment. It's obvious the Hardy Boys tampered with it. Click, click, goes the pen. Yeah, we should have known. I had my doubts. There were no signs of a struggle in his hands. No claw marks on his neck. But still. Yeah, but still. His brow furrows while his eyes glaze over. The lieutenant looks regretful for not figuring this out before. It's okay. Yeah, I think I need to wash myself. Oh, you really, really do. I am glad to hear you say that. Your room in the whirling and rice should come with a bathroom. Shit. Be sure to make use of it in the evening. Can I get in there? Maybe the bullet holds more answers. When does it lock? Does it lock at like 9 o'clock, I think he said? Yes, we should take a closer look at it. I am certain it has more to tell us. Uh. This little thing could reveal much about the weapon that shot you. I don't think I'm going to get in. What happened next? Did my little little place have a thingy? Let me have a look. Uh, there's a bathtub in the Whirling and Rags. A good place to visit once you have some privacy. Will I have to buy another room at that stupid inn? What happens next? We bag the corpse and carry him to the holding pen of my kinema. I can transport him to processing myself, but I will be gone for the rest of the day. Oh, okay. What do you want me to do in the meanwhile? Work on the case. 
Turn to personal matter. Try not to do anything too dangerous. An officer needs backup in a neighborhood like this. Okay. Okay. I'll leave that choice to you. And one more thing. Great work, detective. You looked you in the eye. <gasps> Thank you, Kim. After you bag the corpse, Lieutenant Kitsuragi will lead the party until tomorrow morning. You can do side tasks and even the main case, but it might be more difficult. Plan I is mean, accordingly. I mean, I had some other things that I wanted to do, but we can always do them tomorrow. You know, with it being, this is the perfect time for him to leave because it's like nearly 9 p.m., you know? So I can, I was going to call about um, that body that we found, but we can do that in the morning. We can talk to uh, Class J in the morning. I wanted to talk to those um, hostile, uh, hypothetical policemen again. But, yeah, yeah, this, this is the perfect time, Kim, so let's take him away. All right. He takes out a shiny black body bag and starts pulling the plastic over the dead man's face. I will need a little help carrying him. You take the hands, I'll take the legs. Okay, yeah, that's... okay. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, please don't let it have been uh, 8pm that it closed. Please let it be 9 a.m. 9 a.m. 9 p.m. I just, I really need, I need this win, okay? I need to get the corpse smell off me. Woo! Okay. Excellent. This is not the cleanest bathtub in the world, but it's cleaner than you are right now. It's like, I don't want to run all the way to the other place and it not having a place and having to come back. So I'll have a quick bath in here, you know, while we've still got it available. The bathtub slowly fills with water. The water beckons. Yep, undress, close your eyes and submerge. The water doesn't feel particularly clean. A few beer cans are bobbing up and down along your flanks like sad duckies. Aww. You pause to think before letting your head go under. Now do it, do it, okay? Hold it right there. Keep your head above water or you'll lose all those pheromones Morel sprayed on you. No, I need, I, I need to be clean. I want to be engulfed, okay? The lukewarm water is comforting, like amniotic fluid. I wouldn't put it that way, but okay. You feel nice and lonely. And so, so tired. Uh, take the beer cans out. Let's clean this place up a little bit before I leave. Now you are alone with your thoughts in the tub. But it's easier than being alone with your thoughts outside the tub. Uh, linger in the tub a little. Your fingers grow pale ah. and are covered with tiny whirls as the water cools. Oh, this is healing me, isn't it? Imagine something. This will give me plus morale, I'm guessing. You see the corpse. You can still okay, smell the maybe not. on you. It's going to take more than one bath to get rid of that stench. Okay. Then, houses along a narrow street. A video rental. Darkness on the planet's curvature. Right, let's get out. The water line recedes as you stand. You are cold now. Your clothes <sighs> stick to your still moist skin. I don't care. I've washed the death smell off. And I got kicked out. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. I got there just in time. Uh, so I've got some stuff to interact with. That's what I should do. I should go through all the ones that I've not interacted with while he's not here. So let us zoom out a little bit and let's head to our little cubby hole. Ah. Uh, Police guys have gone, that's a shame. I'll have to talk to them tomorrow. Oh, hey, by the way, Lena. Oh, hello, dear. There you are again. Yeah, I ran into your husband on the coast. Goodness, H how is he? Did he say why he hasn't returned yet? The old woman clasps her hands together over the blankets. He's fine, ma'am. 
As I suspected, he couldn't get back earlier because the water lock in the canal was broken. Now he's just finishing up some work. Oh, yes. That's my morale. He's bound to catch a cold staying out there for so long. But I am so relieved to hear that he's okay. Thank you for putting an old woman's heart at ease, if even a little. Oh, you're welcome. You're really welcome. You haven't, however. There are dangers out there. Our aging bodies fail. Her heart won't rest until Morel is safely back with her. Okay. Shut the fuck up, Empathy. That is not something that we want to tell her or even think about. So, yeah, let's... Kim isn't here. We can talk about cryptids. So, you never told me you've seen the, crypt the phasmid. Oh, you don't want to hear about some old woman's oh, ramblings. Come on, Nina. What else am I going to spend this night on? I really want to know. Well, it was summer. I was building a racing track out of sand on the beach near a tall stand of reeds. Quite a tall one. Many times my height, I remember. When, all of a sudden... What happened? I looked up, and one of the reeds moved. Not like a plant, but like a living thing. It stood up and looked at me. Its body unfolded like some antique toy. I've never seen anything like it. The I've never heard anything into like a creature. it. I thought you said the reeds turned into a preacher, then. I imagined something quite different. I didn't know this can happen, so I reached my arm and touched the thing. It felt just like a stalk of reed, but it moved, swaying, towering above me. After a while, 20 seconds, a minute maybe, it left, went into the reeds. And you never saw it again? Did you follow it? I tried, but I was only a child. There was mud and high water. I couldn't see it anymore. I was just standing there, knee deep in mud looking around me where did you go don't go what then what i ran back home to my grandmother and asked her if reeds could walk and told her they were looking at me <laughs> of course she just laughed at me but i knew what i'd seen For years, it was a story I told at parties when I wanted to impress boys, that sort of thing. Is that how you met Mal? Most people just took it as a strange, amusing anecdote. So did I, honestly. But then I met Morel. And he got really excited and started explaining it? We were on our first date when I told him my story. You should have seen his face. He said my descriptions match the phasmid down to a T. It's white marble limbs, the way it moved. It's limbs, you were on a date? Let's start with the date, yeah? Our first, yes. Oh. The old woman sighs tenderly. So its limbs are white then? Not all of them, as far as I remember. Some of them on the inside, like stalks of marble, if that makes sense. Not really. But sure. And how big? It's hard to say how big things are when you're quite small yourself. To me, it seemed to be taller than I was then, but that's probably not the case. You never know. Could it be in the case? Thank you for sharing this with me, Lena. You're welcome, sweetie. I do appreciate the chance to relive it whenever I get one. It oh. was just... such an impossibly sunshiny day. So warm. Okay. She sighs. And she could get up and walk right into the reeds on her own. Into the mud. Anyway. Okay, Empathy, calm down. Cryptids. Of course, dear. Is there a particular cryptid that you're interested in learning about? Let's start with the biggest cryptid. That would be the giant of Kokonur. She says as if it's common knowledge. Honey, tell me everything. 
The giant lives in the most arid parts of the vast Koko-Nur Desert in South Samara, casting a strange light across the barren wastes. Cool. What do you mean by strange light, though? A uh, mirage or a psychogenous luminance. Okay, you lost me. You got... Okay. You got me for with the first one, but I don't know what a psychogenesis luminance is. And she does not elaborate on the nature of it. And just how big is it supposed to be then? No one knows for sure. It is like an awful mountain appearing from below the horizon, Ooh, expanding to cover almost a third of your field of vision. Okay, is it dangerous? The towering luminosity of Kokonur is a bad omen in local folklore. Some say it's a Fata Morgana. Others, fate unimaginable. That's what makes it so peculiar. A species surviving at the very limits of scientific law. The giant of Kokonur must be the largest animal the planet can support. Okay. There are limits, you see, to how large a metabolism an ecosystem can beget. That Some say sense. a gravity anomaly below the Kokonur desert might allow the creature to grow to these gargantuan sizes. Great. This is great shit. You need more. I do need more, and guess what? Kim's not here to say no. So what about, we've talked about the biggest, what's the tiniest? Cryobacter catlensis. Oh. Cryobacter catlensis? Yes, a unicellular bacterium that was discovered in one of the northernmost points of Kotla on the Boreal Plateau by renowned geologist Caitlin Mijanu some 70 years ago. That was quite not that long ago, is it? What's so special about it? Is it just the tiniest? bacterial colony Mijanu found had remained alive while frozen in ice for longer than anyone Ooh. could reliably estimate. Certainly from before recorded history. Shit, that's, that's a while. Mijanu disappeared shortly after injecting herself with the bacteria she had brought back to study. No doubt in hopes of prolonging her own life. Wait. What? She injected herself with it? Yes. The bacteria had survived in the ice since times immemorial. It is not hard to see where she could have gotten the idea. <laughs> Still a weird idea. A weird thought, thinking that that'd work. Do you really think that's an immortal geologist wandering the world? Yes, and she's quite mad too. After she treated herself with the bacteria, she stopped aging, but also became increasingly eccentric and irascible, so that even her oldest friends were forced to pull away. Okay. We can assume that she has been living somewhere in the wilderness for decades now, all alone except for the cryobacter catlensis coursing through her bloodstream. Okay. <laughs> I mean, the the... The tiniest cryptid was not as interesting as the immortal geologist. And I would love to know more about her, but... Okay, invisible cryptid. Tell me more that, about that. What an interesting question. And the answer is, yes, there are. What is it? The cold mama d'aqua, or thin whisper of sound. And that's precisely what it seems to be. Self-replicating sound waves, invisible and... Intangible. It's very afraid of us, which makes it incredibly difficult to track. Oh, why is it afraid of us? Yeah, why why is the Mama De Deca so afraid of us? That is a sad story. A group of university students assisting with the field work in their enthusiasm for the project, and no doubt because they were preoccupied with impressing their professors, nearly drove it to extinction. Oh dear. They tried to communicate with it and had no other means but sound. 
So they started sending out sound waves at frequencies they thought might match the Mama Daquas. And what happens when a sound wave meets another sound wave at the same frequency, dear? Uh, they cancel each other out. Exactly. And these tests were performed so recklessly that when they happened upon the right frequency, well, they wiped out most of the population. What fucking little shits. Great regret washes over her. A wending cloth. It's not your fault. After that, the corpusol appears to have migrated elsewhere. I would there have too. Been recordings of anomalies similar to those spotted in Ea, but they've been few and far between. It's impossible to confirm the presence of any stable Kaltamama Dakwa population anywhere. What does it sound like? Like nothing. It's such a high-pitched sound that us humans can't hear it, nor can other animals. It could be ringing right outside your window and you wouldn't even know it. It could be anywhere. Everywhere, even. But how could an animal be a sound, then? And how did people find it in the first place if it didn't sound like anything? Many scientists have asked the same question. Some have claimed that it isn't itself a sound, but a tiny corpuscle that emits sound waves. But there's no evidence to support this theory. Just a theory, huh? So what evidence is there that this animal being a sound? Plenty. It's the evidence that led to its discovery. In the 20s, a group of areopagi ornithologists, that is, scientists who study birds, we're trying out a new recording technology for capturing sounds outside the range of human hearing. When playing back recordings they had made in the foothills of the Ea mountain range, they noticed certain anomalies, patterns that seemed random at first, but on closer examination were consistent with the waveforms of songbirds. Songbirds? The scientists soon discovered they could track and even predict what appeared to be feeding, mating, and migration patterns based on sound waves in a strictly delimited range of ultrasonic frequencies, even higher than those of the highest pitched bat calls. They realized that they had discovered a new species and called it the Koldumama Dakwa, after the Parakanasian name for the voice of God, which is said to be very silent. Wow. Mm -hmm. They grew quite obsessed with these little birds. Even though they couldn't see them, they could distinguish among individual birds and even began to name some of them. Oh, they got so close and then they wiped them out like idiots. Sequester, time, just can. Those are but some of the Mama Dakwa they followed individually. Could it be here right now? It could be. As I said, it could be everywhere. And we wouldn't know any better. It could be ringing all the days of our lives and nights. Oh, that was very interesting, Nina. And about what? Oh, man, I just can't get enough of these cryptids. I'm glad you like them, but I'm not really one to tell you about all of them. You should ask my husband if you get the chance. He's the real nah, expert. I love talking to you about it, Lena. But that's all for now. Oh, that was a nice uh, wool. There we go. That was a nice conversation. Uh, it's time for a brisk walk back to my new area. Ooh, we got a thingy. Was that? Could it be the Koldamama Dakwa? No, it's probably just your imagination ringing in your ear. No, is it? Is it ringing? Listen more closely. There seems to be an extremely high-pitched ring. Ultrasonic. Lena said it was very high-pitched, right? Ooh. It's like something tickles your ear. Ooh. Lena also said that it couldn't be heard by any other animal, including humans. Oh. What you're hearing must just be a regular bird. Logic, don't be a downer. Listen closely first. 
There it is again. You are about to rediscover a long lost species. Ooh. Yeah, but how are you going to catch it? Keep listening. It must be very close. Maybe, just maybe, it will come towards you. Move your head towards the sound. Oh no. The sound. It's moving away. Somewhere over there. Go after it. Where's that? Where's that? No. Too late. It's gone. There is no rain anymore. Just the sound of the streets. No, come back, please. Keep your ears peeled, then. If the species really has migrated to Martinez, you're sure to hear it again. Everything leaves me. Oh, I forgot that I had a thing. Let me. Where are. It's a really bad time to do this because I can't see anything. You heard it? The mysterious Col de Mama Dakar. You're certain that you did? Well, maybe not certain, but let's say you're hopeful because it would make you very special. Be the only human being who can hear this invisible, incorporeal word, this inanimate whisper, this particle of sound. You're going to have to keep listening. Sharpen your ear. Okay. I'll, I'll consider it, but you know, not not quite yet. Quite a lot of. I think I'm going the wrong way. Unless I want to swim across. Which I do not want to send it swim across. Oh, Kim's not here. Can I talk to that pail driver about the pail? Is it this way? No. How do I get around to her? It's this bit over here, right? Up here? Maybe, eventually. Crossing. Hey, dude. I, I forgot that I want. How do I get down? There we go. I forgot that I wanted to talk to her. And then it was too late. Hello. Loma, you called me at an opportune moment. The awful weather keeps me awake. You can entertain me with your questions. Hmm. Before I came, you seemed away. What do you mean? You were in a dream, inactive, turned off. Yes. What about it? The, the routes you drive are unusual, aren't they? Some of them. Some of them are like home to me now. I would say the routes I drive are unusual to me. What routes do you drive? Lomonosov's Lounge, Udajnaya Zemlya, West of Blaine. She nods and closes her eyes again, letting her mind submerge. The Transcatalia Magistral. You for one end. Aristrada of Dumeral. All the good ones. The deep trenches. Where the bluebirds fly. She opens her eyes again and shudders. Uh, cool. Ride right into your dust, sister. Irma. I already am dust. Okay. I think I know what's going on with you. And what is that? She sticks a filterless cigarette into a cigarette holder and reaches for the light. You're a pail driver. You transport goods through the pail. Oh, my Deus. The lawman solved the case. Hey, I didn't know about um, the pail at all, like, three days ago, so... And here I was, thinking you were an idiot. So, are you? An oh. idiot. I mean. Maybe, but uh, I blacked out after a heavy night of drinking and lost all memory of the world. <laughs> like Gabriel Buenguerro in Pergunte Apoeira. You're the opposite of me, then. I remember everything. Even things I never knew. Oh. Things you never knew? The smell of liquor on Gabriel's lips after the shoot. In the motor park. The roses on the day of Franco Negro's coronation, on the grand stairs of Briar. The smoke from the fouling pits when Dolores' day was shot. The look on her face like an orgasm. The wound in her chest, my hand in my father's hand. Except 
I never had a father, and I never shot her innocent of Dolores Day. Of a radiation? Heroic doses, Rivera. Heroic. Isn't that dangerous? Thought insertion? Dithering? The Grad Catalan Magistral? It's more than dangerous. It's sad. But I further had to make a living. Now, when you've seen it all go away like that, rolling off like the sea, and then come back to this. She gestures at the square, the broken horse monument, the clanging of machines in the distance. What are we doing here? For thousands of years, Gabriel. It doesn't have to be like this. We can just give up. We can just become a vapor. What does it look like, the pale? Like looking into the ocean at night, in the dark. And? You cannot see it, but you know it's there. And it's big, bigger than anything. Bigger than all the other things combined. What does it feel like? Nothing. Until it starts. When you are deep enough. Then, for me, it's like autumn. Dark, grey and orange. The orange of the street lights and the color of the streets and the electric light. It smells like autumn too. It smells terrible. Nostalgia. Cooped up in the cabin, shaking. Terrible nostalgia. For yourself. For humans. It's too much to bear. She loves it. How do you pass through it then? In the belly of an airship, behind the cell windows. So you don't look straight into it. It's not advised to look into it. Not in this lobby then? No, the same one, a roller. They all are nowadays. Special wheels for connecting to the floor of the hole. The wheels all small and round. Multi-axle trailers. Okay, so you said we can just become vapor. One last thing I should ask. You know, I completely blew it off at first, but slightly interesting. Yes. Okay. No elaboration. I would rather have what I have than what you have. I would rather have what you have than what I have. I feel I already have what you have in some way. What would I rather want? Would I rather remember things that I didn't do, or would I remember nothing of my life? I, I like the idea of like a clean slate, you know? Like, a lot of things that she saw was like, sins and stuff that she didn't do. You know, she didn't kill Dolores Day. I wouldn't want to have the blood on my hands that aren't actually on my hands, if that makes any sense, so... Yeah, I would rather have what I have than what you have. They say there is a point, one that I have not crossed. The pearl, super deep. If you stray too far, of course, on the u for one a or in Lomonosov's land, where every step you take is one step further from home, no matter the direction. That's creepy. It's a point you cannot come back from. Your mind becomes so radiant with the past, there is a flip. Instead of writing, it erases memory, nearing some kind of mm. indescribable finale. Sounds a little like what I had. Maybe you've been down the motorway south? I don't know. The motorway south? She looks at her cigarette, it's almost out. She swallows, she has swallowed it hungrily, then at you. It's a story as lone horse men tell. Lone horse men, Harifa, not pearl drivers. Way beyond the established pearl that's lit by radio frequencies, where it goes silent and dark. And the process begins, erasure, kilometer by kilometer, in any direction. The motorway south is a road you cannot come back from. Creepy. Do we know what's at the end? No one knows what's at the end. I've only glimpsed the beginning. I've only felt it in the distance when I was a child. 
a child rowing on the lake. She goes silent, her eyes closed and her hands shake. Ma'am? <sighs> Who's young? A sigh escapes her lips, lips, then silence, as she stares within herself. There is nothing more to do now. She's far away. Okay. Why is that? Oh, I've got another one from Motway South. At the edge of the map, the landmass begins to disintegrate into pure trigonometry. The ocean melts, becoming a tangle of sines and cosines. The mountain range turns into a sharp angled azimuth. Its green rain shadow dithers like music turning into a wave form and then vanishes. This is the end, a half remembered textbook from your childhood. The porch collapsing on the edge of the ice. A transition from reality to pale, a single vector shoots out like a rocket. It's the motorway south, splintering off from the unknown. Splintering off from the known pales to where? Where does it go? I don't know whether my thoughts could answer that question. Probably leave me even more confused than I already am. And let me tell you, I'm confused. Why can't you go that way? Why do you have to be an asshole? Uh, no. What, what the fuck was that for? Jeez. Somebody's just left a bottle there. Do I have my bag? I do have my bag. Do I have anything in my bag? Excuse me. What's in my bag? Ooh, I got eight bottles. But uh, I'll go I'll go sell once I've got ten. Once I've got over ten. So let's head back to the place that that lady was kind enough to let me uh, stay at. Uh, what time do you think we should head to bed? It is currently 9.38, so you know. Oh, I need to do that. Let's do that in the morning with Kim, though. If we're going to find a phasmid, I want Kim to be there to show that, yep, they actually uh, exist. It's around this way, I believe. Just follow this is not the right way was I wrong I believe I was jeez let's go up this no that is the right way what on earth is going on oh I've just remembered something where is it here map we we got um I thought we had a I thought we could fast travel. I guess not. I could have sworn it told me that I could. But I guess not. Okay. Let's uh, keep moving this way then. Oh, let's go up these stairs. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. <laughs> it's oh getting dear. late and it's raining. Time to call it a day. Oh, is this... Will I end the day completely? Not yet. Let me look at some stuff while I'm here. So I've looked at this, right? Yes, the door going to make a mix. I've looked at that. I've looked at the map. I've looked at the gum, I believe. Did I? I've looked at that. I've looked at that. I've got a book. I've got an envelope. Let's look at the envelope first and then we'll read another book. We also might look at the uh, thingy as well. So let's look at you the take envelope. The legal documents out of the envelope. A 12 to 40 month construction period and the zoning plan in the addendum. Okay, so look at the zoning plan. The youth center cuts into the ocean like the bow of some great modern ship. 
Apparently, it's going to cover most, if not all, of the street and the square between the existing houses. It's three stories tall. Hmm. It's going to be awfully close to the already existing buildings, almost wall to wall, practically integrating them into the youth center. This is either an ominous or cool architectural choice. Hard to say. Okay. So logic, it's got an on ominous shape and the center is close to the houses. So try and find a loophole then. There is no loophole. The simple truth is the current residents are going to lose their street access and for the next 12 to 40 months, their lives will be dominated by constant construction noise right next door. So what are the ramifications then? Once the construction starts, it will probably take a few months, a year maybe, for even the most stubborn occupants to get tired of living like this. After that, they'll sell their property for cheap and move out. Oh, that sucked. Can I do anything? Well, you could trick Everard. Get some random people to sign the document. By the time the union boss finds out, your business here will be already concluded. Ooh. Put the documents back in the envelope. Who'd be stupid enough to do that, though? <laughs> and then they come up to the karaoke and they saw the name Gart and I was like, Gart wouldn't sign the signatures. Uh, find someone to sign the document instead of the intended signees. Okay. I'll have a think about that then. Okay, so we've got our two books. I might read that one. I've read that one. I had a look at that one. I believe I also looked at my badge. And I looked at the library card. So let's look at the fractured bullet then. The bullet mushroomed out on impact. It now looked more like a fanciful jacket button than something that could pierce flesh, skin and bone. The bullet is safely sealed away in a plastic bag bearing the RCM stamp. Kim has filled out the label on the bag with the item number, case number and date and location the bullet was found. Okay, thank you, Kim. Beside his orderly handwriting, the bullet looks especially sad, like a tiny, shriveled head of collar. Ah, what do I do with you, bullet? The squished little thing has no idea. The poor squished little thing. I know. You should find the gun that shot this bullet. Oh, that's a good idea. It's my friend. I'm going to start talking to it. It will keep me company. We don't want the horrific necktie to get jealous, so maybe not that. So let's find the gun that shot it. That sounds like something a police detective would do. First, you should learn all you can okay. about this little guy. Okay. Then find the gun that shot it and the person that gun belongs to. He used it to kill your victim. Exactly. Yes. Neat. So, feel the bullet through the bag? The squashed bullet has some sharp edges where the jacket has split open. It feels cold, even through the bag. Ooh, and inspect the bullet closer. The jacket of the bullet is made of a yellowish metal. It has blossomed out to reveal a dark grey core. The base of the bullet is close to five millimetres in diameter. I know it means something completely different, but every time it says jacket, I imagine this little bullet in like a yellow jacket. And I'm like, oh, it's kind of cute. So let's look at the jacket. You can just about make out a few strations near the base of the bullet. Little hairlines, linear. It feels standard. And look at the core. It's quite destroyed. Some of the fragments are still lodged in the wound. What's interesting about the bullet thus far? Uh, it's a jacked bullet close to five millimeters in diameter. A jacketed bullet, which would have been shot from a military grade breech loading rifle, not from a muzzle loader like those typically found on the streets of Martinez. So, what do you think? You think that his buddies might have killed him? Very interesting. 
You have an unusual military grade bullet in your hand. Now all you need is to find a gun that could fire it. Okay, so I have oh I, I have a similar rifle on hand. I do. One of those old ones. And I'm aware of the name of the antique rifle. So yeah, let's have a go. 83%. A rifle. Revolutionary period. Your bullet looks to be an old 4.46 millimeter from the surplus left over from the turn of the century. Probably an antique or a retrofitted antique. Okay, what about the make? The 4.46 caliber was widely used with the Velma grade rifle, a Revacholian manufacturer. The BM dominated the battlefields of the Insulindian theater of the anti centennial revolution. 50 years ago. Incidentally, you have just such a rifle with you. The dusty old thing you found hidden in the basement below the commercial area. It's unusable, sadly. If it were, the bullet would probably fit the chamber. Is anyone still making those rifles? No, but Zeliger, a major firearm manufacturer, ended up with a surplus after the war. So there are still a lot of these old military rifles floating around, usually broken. The quality was appalling. Oh dear. And who uses these rifles these days? I'm guessing maybe militants? Antiques enthusiasts? Guerrilla fighters. fighters? In distant countries? A few lucky jamrock bangers? You're looking for the same thing you found in that hidden weapons cache there. Only in working order. Well, I will be definitely interested in knowing what make those his buddies have. Back at the station, the lieutenant is standing at a counter, diligently filling out paperwork to hand over to a tired records clerk. You should share your findings with him as soon as Okay, possible. yeah. The bullet has nothing more to say. Put it away. Okay, and it's... So locate the working firearm that shoots 4.46 ammo. Let's finish that. Oh yeah, I washed the death, death smell off. And I got another skill point, so... It's 10 to 10. It's a bit too early still for me to go to bed, so... Let's read some Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. Another Dick Mullen book that woefully misrepresents the nature of police work. In this one, one detective returns from a trip having successfully solved one case, only to embark on another. Does he finally face the taxing nature of his occupation? No, he doesn't even look like a normal officer of the law. In your hand, you hold Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. The brittle paperback feels fragile to the touch. Examine the cover. The cover features a pastiche of different scenes. In the foreground, a man in a dark overcoat clutches a pistol to his chest. Rising up behind him are two silhouettes wrapped in a passionate embrace. <gasps> oh no. The tagline reads, Detective Dick Mullen must prove his innocence after an old friend is murdered by someone who looks just like Dick Mullen. That it... seems to sum up the premise nicely. Is it his evil twin? Needless to say, it violates nearly every RCN regulation for a detective to investigate a murder in which he is a suspect. Well, maybe it'll still be entertaining because, you know, it's not necessarily about the truth, it's about entertainment. So let's start reading. The story opens with a knock at the door. Detective Dick Mullen is greeted by an old friend, Charlie Spillane, who's come to Mullen to ask a favour on this dark and cold night. Not a dark and cold night. That's a night that in a book that just means that there's going to be a murder. Spillane needs Mullen to drive him in from Vespa to a small town along the Insulindian coast. Despite his friend's apparent agitation, Mullen does as he's asked, then returns home where he passes out drunk, as he does most nights. Let me guess, he gets woken up by a knock on the door? Does he get arrested, or does he just get told he's a murder suspect? An extremely unprofessional and hurtful stereotype that's offensive to all upstanding officers of the law. Look, I really can't judge that. Two days later, 
McMullen is arrested by the Vespa police and charged with the murder of Charlie Spillane. At his interrogation, Mullen learns that Charlie Spillane was shot in a bar in the very town Mullen dropped him off in by a man matching Mullen's description. <gasps> no, everybody's obviously lying in that bar. Desperate to clear his name, Mullen manages to convince the Vespa police to release him for three days so that Mullen may solve his friend's murder and prove his innocence. Oh yeah, that's weird. That's why that's weird way to do it. What you do is you break out of the police the police uh, place and then you go on a on the run trying to prove your innocence. That's a way better plot line for a story like that. But yeah, no way Mullen did it. Unless he did do it, that'd be an interesting plot of course, twist. Mullen didn't do it. That's the whole premise of the book. Anyway, Mullen returns to the seaside bar where Spillane was murdered and meets a beautiful, mysterious woman named Diana De Nerva. Oh, now it's getting interesting. De Nerva reveals that she was Spillane's lover and that he was mixed up with a local amphetamine <sighs> smuggling operation. As soon as Mullen begins pulling at strings, the whole conspiracy begins to unravel. Of course it does. Not only is the local police captain in on the amphetamine ring, so is the son of a powerful politician and a strung-out art collector named Torvald, each of whom has his own reasons for wanting Spillane dead. Okay, so tell me about the crooked police captain. Outwardly, the old police captain is a real law and order crypto-fascist, a barrel-chested man who's beaten his share of suspects to pulp. But he's also dirty and increasingly paranoid that someone's going to expose his role in the drug ring. Of course. He would certainly have the motive and the means, but the captain walks with a noticeable limp from an old war injury. Is it possible that he was able to conceal it long enough to commit the murder? And what about the politician's son? A typical privileged twat. In all likelihood, he's just in over his head. He does bear a personal grudge against Belaine, though. A former prosecutor who nearly brought down his father's administration. The kid doesn't exactly have Dick Mullen's manly build, but he is the correct height. And while interrogating him at his home, Mullen did notice a certain overcoat that looks suspiciously like his own. And what about the art collector? Torvald, the art collector, is a strung out mess. Frankly, it's hard to imagine him holding a pistol steady enough to actually hit someone, let alone plug them three times in the chest the way Ospelaine got did. And I feel like he did it. I feel like they all did it. That said, Torvald and Spillane have a long history. And while interrogating him, Mullen discovers that Torvald was once involved with Diana Deneuve. Could it be that this is all over a sordid love triangle? Ooh, get on with the story. Who did it? One evening, Diana Deneuve comes to Mullen's hostel room in tears. The two of them drink half a bottle of vodka and soon they're seeking comfort in each other's arms. Did she do it? Well, that testimony won't be admissible any longer. Yeah, how does Mullen expect to solve the murder if he's sleeping with the witnesses? You sleep with your partner. The man's a prosecutor's nightmare. Solving a murder counts for nothing if all the evidence gets thrown out in court over police misconduct. Uh, I'm sh not sure I'm happy with this. But maybe the story will turn it around? As the two lovers share a post-coital cigarette, Diana Deneuve turns to Mullen and says, By the way, Dick, there was something else I meant to tell you. And then she dies. I love you. No. Always aim for the center of mass. No. Whatever it is, Mullen never yep. hears the oh. words. A blow to the base of his skull knocks him out cold instantly. <laughs> Fuck. When Mullen comes to, Deneuve is dead on the hostel bed next to him. To make matters oh. worse, his clothes are covered with her blood. I just assumed that she'd be like, shot in the head. But nope. Double fuck. Mullen trashes his blood-stained clothes and flees the hostel, knowing it's only a matter of hours before the cops discover Deneuve's body, if they haven't been tipped off already. 
Yeah, they'd probably be tipped off if he wasn't the one who did it. Fleeing a crime scene, destroying evidence, even if Detective Mullen didn't commit the murder, he should be facing years behind bars. All right, calm down. The heat is on. If Big Mullen can't solve both murders before the cops catch up to him, he's going away for life. Can you solve the case before the cops close in? Okay, have I, I've got some questions first. What is it, Detective? Okay. I, will, I, I assume that there'd be interesting questions, not these. Why does everyone close to Dick Mullen wind up dead? It's a dangerous line of work, but somebody has to do it. That's why Dick Mullen never lets anyone get too close. I was like, maybe the questions will be like, who was the last person who saw him? But no, apparently it's uh, these weird questions. Why did he become a detective in the first place? There was never a time when he wasn't a detective. He was born a detective. Was I not born to be a detective? For a moment, you cease to read the story on the page and see the book for what it is. A collection of brittle, cheaply printed pages held together by glue made from the hooves of horses. Oh, thank you. You won't find the answers you're looking for here, in other words. Why bother solving crimes when the world is so evil? Is it really so evil, Detective? Okay, maybe not. There are parts worth saving. Like Kim. Like what? Friends and family. Do you even have those? I've got Kim! Just make sure you don't lose him. You'll not find another life. I won't! He said, come to work, detective, to me, and my heart skipped a beat. It's true, in more ways than you know. Yeah, he's probably the last partner I'll ever get. I'm just gonna, like, at the end of this case, if we don't walk off into the sunset together, I will like throw away all the respect and dignity that I have and cling to his legs crying asking him not to leave me no not asking pleading begging him not to leave me but then what does this book know it's just a poorly made piece of pulp garbage made to be consumed and discarded well well you know I figured it out oh shit it's midnight I was I, I only wanted to read a couple of pages and then I've just Skip through the entire goddamn book. Oops. Yeah, I figured it out. So, who did it, Detective? Who killed Charlie Spillane and Deanna Deneur? Um. Okay, okay, okay. I believe that it was the junkie art collector. Because I feel like the other two would not get their hands dirty. They'd get other people to kill him. Yeah, the police captain wants to maybe kill him to shut him up without, you know, him being dirty. But would you really want to dirty your hands even more by killing a person? You know, there's one thing about being corrupt and then there's killing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the politician's twat son is not going to do the dirty business. So I think it's the junkie art collector. Could be. Who knows? Only one way to find out. Finish the book. You begin furiously flipping through pages. Even as you know these books follow a series of well-worn tropes, you find yourself completely engrossed. You're turning pages so fast, you don't even notice the ancient spine coming unglued. Oh dear. You try to grab the pages as they come loose, but Fuck. your fingers aren't quick enough. They've gone. Dozens of pages scatter across the ground. The last fifth or so of the book seems to have been lost. It's possible that you could gather and reassemble the pages, but it would take way too long. Stupid old horse glue. Yes, blame a dead horse for your fat. It wasn't fingers. my fat clumsy fingers, it was a bad book. In your hand, you hold four fifths of Dick Mullen and the mistaken identity. Wow, great, I'm going to go to bed angry now. Put the book away. It's getting cold, this late in the night. Time to call it a day. Into the snack shack. I'd like to know. I'd like you to know that even though I was angry, I did not slam it shut. Oh, I could have just like um, 
just done it here. What's this here? Oh. On the table, you see a bowl of water, a rough soap, and next to it, a small hand mirror. A straight razor soaks inside the wash basin. Is shaving the right call? The water reflects back a vague image of your face. Nose bulbous and red, hair unkempt, wrinkles lining the eyes and forehead. The stash is gigantic. Because, yeah, you're right, it's gigantic. It covers, like, a fifth of my face. And that might be a good thing. So let me leave for now. <laughs> is that a mirror? An old mirror hangs on the wall. You see the reflection of your face in it. Adorned with the expression. Let's leave the mirror be for now. But, yep. Yeah. Oh, this bed looks so more bed comfortable. Is if a bit run down, still, you've earned a rest. Then I guess it's time to go to sleep. That looks like a lovely bed. Across the room, the heating system hums its <gasps> soft heating lullaby. System. The mattress feels soft and sheets warm. It only takes you moments for the world to fall away. Thoughts, baby. A million little lights in the dark. You're one fine instrument, brother. All those faces and all those names. All that laughter and screaming and scheming around. Every corner and every street. Okay. Recorded in you, forever, on verite. Spinning, spinning, tell me, am I dreaming? No, you're spinning tapes at the discotheque. The great unceasing disco of the mind. The flash, the bang. The endless learning experience. Spinning in eternity. On and on it goes. For untold hours. At the disco where you first asked her to dance. Rising. Rising. Above the dark curvature. The great wingspan of sleep. Studied with stars. Behold, there are millions of them down there. The first time, the last time, the smoke in her mouth, the plotted flowers, the faces turning, changing. I should not talk to these guys i don't understand anything what they're saying what are you talking about what is it it's the world harry boy and you're made of it every day you're out there you make more of yourself from it i'm afraid you can't be unmade oh, now. no can never forget this shit. Oh yeah, I don't want to. Beautiful. It's stuck on loop. Whirling, spitting out words and images. Alright, calm down. You're the son of the world again. Harrister. A ceaseless agent. Picking up litter and old newspapers. Collecting your little bubblegum wrappers and idiotic picture postcards. Meaningless, meaningless keepsakes. Reading your awful letters and recalling things, aren't you? The endless names of the world. An address book you are. The map of a city. 
That's kind of a nice way of saying it, I think. Maybe, or, or maybe it's a bad way of saying it. Yeah, I guess I am an agent of the world. You'll go insane if you keep going like this. One more day, and you'll be in the loony bin. I just know you will. And for what, brother man? I mean, let's be real. If I end up in the loony bin, probably deserved. Well, not deserved, probably needed. Because I'm, you know, talking to myself. I drank so much I forgot everything that I knew. For the working class. For the working class. I guess I could go to the loony bin for the working class. For the money, baby. Why would I get money for doing that? Although, you know, I would like more money. For the greater good. Mm, I guess. I don't like the idea for the great good. Makes me think of Hot Fuzz. The greater good. Solving your little crossword puzzle. Doing your tasks. Crossing names off lists. Trying to become some sort of world detector. It won't make it okay. It won't put smoke back in her mouth. Uh, yeah, we are making progress, okay? Measured, steady progress. There he goes again. He's a real political animal, our Harry. Not really. He still doesn't see that it's the world changing around him. Yeah, probably. No, he still doesn't see that it's the world that's changing him. That's not what you said. He's got no idea what he's in for. Why? Cause only love can break your heart. Okay, feel the pillow under your cheek and attempt to go back to sleep. Beep, beep, beep! No! The alarm is ringing, Harry! The disco circus goes on and on! You barely slept three hours last night! Oh, fuck you! That's because you two don't stop talking! I need to sleep! Do it for the picture puzzle. Put it all together. Solve the world. One conversation at a time. Hell yeah. What a, what an idea to wake up to. One conversation at a time. First conversation will probably be with Kim. That's a thought to look forward to. That's probably a thought that makes me open my eyes. I healed my morale. <laughs> look at me. Oh no, oh no. Shake the cobwebs from my head! Shake him, shake it, shake the baby! Okay, what's this, uh, like, over pet wall? Good. You're up. Listen, there's something that's been bothering you for a few days now. Is there, or is it something that's been bothering you for a few days now? It's a suspicion, or a feeling, really, that things are not quite in hand around here. What do you mean by that? An earth-shattering deduction from your psyche. What will those guys come up with next? Every day, things seem to spin more and more wildly, out of control. The center isn't holding. And despite your efforts to moderate and contain these energies, things only seem to be getting worse. I I disagree with you completely there. I agree with my first thought where it says I think things were going pretty well. Like, obviously, we're getting to new places and talking to people and things are opening up more, but we're also getting closer to, like, you know, what we need to do. We need to solve this uh, this this murder. And it's like... I don't know. Yeah, you know, I thought things were going pretty well, Empathy. Oh, sure. You've been making yeah. progress on your case, interviewing people, solving side tasks. Wait, you have a case of your own? What's your case? But who's focusing on the big questions? Yeah, this really doesn't sound like my job. Open your eyes. Stop getting distracted by details. It's time you started focusing on what really matters. 
of what really matters? What am I supposed to do? You've got to find out who bears la responsibility. La responsibility? The most awesome, terrible thing. It is human nature to crave la responsibility and to deny it. That's why it must be distributed <sighs> across many different organizations, agencies, offices, and portfolios. Yeah, I thought I was assigning responsibility, you know, for the murder. I feel like that's the only job that I have at the moment. Harry, Harry, you're thinking about this too narrowly. And I think you're thinking of it too broadly. Let's focus on the little thing and do the big thing later. La responsibility isn't concerned with trivial questions like who killed who. It's about the real issues. The human welfare index, the price of staple goods, the transition to real democracy. <sighs> fine, fine. Give it to me. I'll accept responsibility. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, for this sake. isn't some kind of dictatorship. You can't simply seize la responsibility for yourself. Okay, I it won't must then. be given by a legitimate authority. What? Like a committee. Okay, and who should sit on this committee to give me responsibility for something that you're, you know, not even really going into detail about? Only the most even keeled minds in Martinet. It's Martinet. Your half brother, the lieutenant, is a natural <laughs> place to start. I forgot that we thought he was our half-brother. He is not our half-brother. We are not related to him in any way, shape, or form. And I would like to be just clear of that. This is not a Dick Mullen book. I am not going to find, you know, a lady to have sex with. You know, it's not going to be Class J. It's not going to be Zuna or whatever her name is. It's not going to be Joyce, although I would be willing to do Joyce. The two of us, you know, she's cool. Together you'll be able to discover who has la responsibility in Rivershaw. And, if necessary, you will have the wisdom and expertise to assign it among yourselves. Right, okay, and what happens once we've assigned responsibility? Most likely, your findings will be collected in a report, which will be carefully reviewed by your superiors. Once they've reviewed it, those same superiors will produce a set of recommendations to be taken up at the next meeting of the Standing Committee. Rest assured, no matter what happens, it will be done through the proper channels. Okay, let's, let's, let's accept the task and take on this awesome burden and then probably not do it because it sounds like a drag. Good luck. Your report is eagerly anticipated. Oh, Thursday, take on less responsibility. Things down here are a mess. Someone really ought to do something about it. First, though, you and some other moralists should probably form a committee to decide whose job it is. Form a committee of moralists to assign responsibility. Kim might know where to start. I feel like he won't, but sure. Okay. Hey guys, thanks for watching me play. If you liked what you saw, consider subscribing to my channel by pressing the button to the right. And if you fancy anything else watching what I do, then click one of the videos to the left. Anyway, I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!